yes. out of all the jobs I ever had, principal was my favorite job. I, I like, I, and I worked at central office. I, I love being a vice principal. I, I love being, a, I love being a principal. Mm-hmm. I loved it. And it is tough um, to see a lot of people don't want to go into that position. And I'm hearing more like there's teacher mm-hmm. shortages, but I hear there's principal shortages too uh, all over North America. So somebody who's like kind of thinking about it, you know, and like there's, 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 there's positives and negatives to every position. But mm-hmm. if you're talking to someone who is like just kind of on that tip that they might want to go into like school administration, like what would, what would you like, how could you like sell them on that? Like that here's, here's like why this is a, a great opportunity. I'm a, I'm gonna be clear and concise. First, I speak a lot about this on, on my podcast. Um, and like the episodes that I do, what, what's your, what's your podcast called? Unapologetic leadership. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, yeah, man. Appreciate that. No, I talk a lot about this. And I, you know, when I talk to school leaders, I'm like, you know, if you could talk to somebody who's looking or like the story that you're talking about, if you could tailor this to somebody who's thinking about or that are in their first year, that's like, man, I don't know if I made the right decision. Right. Um, I, I'm going to be honest. Like there are, there, to be honest, there are more, for me, there's more pros than cons to leading a building, right? Like I, get to make change on a very large scale by having that 30,000 foot view. But then I get a choice to say, you know what, I'm going to go and do this today. I'm going to go and sit with this group. You know what? I want to go on a field trip with these students or this group of students, or I'm going to go participate in some after school event. Like you get, you get the ability to choose a lot of things to go and participate in because you have a global perspective. Right. Uh, my wife always asked me, she's like, you know, you got to go to that. You got to go to that. It's like, yeah, I, I do. Nobody's telling me I have to. I get to go do it because I get to see kids at their best. Um, I've seen a kid who struggled like this is where they're successful. Like I get to go and be there because I know those stories. Um, um, the job is challenging. Yes. Not, hands down. Job is challenging. But uh, when I say it's it's rewarding, like you can look back on um you get to look back on what you've done over the years. I always tell my students and I tell staff like, man, what's your legacy? Like, what is the story right. that people are going to say, tell about you when you leave? They're going to say, yep, they got in the seat, they maintain and they like things just kind of stayed the same. Or we were able to do this. We had these awesome experiences just through the connections that we have. And we did that. You know what I mean? Like there's, you can create a culture that's defined by your vision and your mission to want to do great for kids and your staff. Like yeah. for me, that's my day-to-day mission. Like I get to go to work every day to do, to, to move forward in the mission and vision that I have as the principal set for this building. I'm just thinking as you're talking, um, you mentioned like the three o'clock meeting, right? And I think yeah. sometimes people will say, you know, like our teachers like really don't see the value of, of that three o'clock meeting. And they'll spend a ton of time doing things to try to convince the teacher, like the teachers at that time is well spent, as opposed to saying like, maybe it isn't valuable. Maybe we should be doing something instead of this. Right. Cause I think a lot of times we are, we do things that we see aren't that great, but then they're, but then we try to convince others they're, they're awesome. And maybe as opposed to maybe like, Hey, maybe that isn't good. Maybe that isn't helpful. Maybe we need to get rid of that. And there's a better use of our time. There's a better way we can connect, better way we can learn uh, and doing that too. Uh, I want, um, here's a question that I have. And I think this is for anything that we do with professional learning when we read books like this. So I'm a teacher, I'm reading this book and I, I'm like all, I'm all in on the working less. Like I'm, I'm like, you, you got me on the working less, right? Uh, but how, how would me working less actually improve student learning yeah so uh, to start with when you just think about yourself in the sense of just just sleep right if you're working lots you often sleep less you probably eat more junk food just because you're tired you tend to then eat right. less like not healthy foods you're not getting essays you're not looking after yourself you then go into a classroom you have kids mucking up in front of you you're tired you're not really thinking well and then your responses to that are actually not the best responses that you're going to have in that classroom. Whereas if you compare that to a person who comes in, who's focused, who's rested, who is very focused in what they want to achieve in that lesson, they deal with things differently. 
and it can be the same person, one tired and one not. And it just you just get a, a much better quality out of the person who's looking after themselves as well. And so actually by reducing your workload, you are going to be a better teacher because when you go into your classroom, when you're sitting down with your students, when you're trying to help them and trying to, you, know, you have those students who are stuck, who can't quite get a concept. And if you're tired, you get frustrated with that. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're not tired, if you're engaged and you're motivated and you've spent time, you've prioritized, you know, uh, some kind of research that you were doing to try and help uh, uh, this particular concept or whatever. And you're like, oh, actually, you know, I recently read this article about how to describe this differently, or I saw this really cool video recently and you can actually re try another angle for teaching something rather than just getting frustrated with it and so you can really reduce what you're doing and you can also shift into more effective strategies you know the part of what you do once as you are increasing your own effectiveness is you go well in my classroom what am i doing that actually is going to have the the impacts that i want you know am i just coming in here and because i'm tired i'm pulling up last year's powerpoint you know, I'm walking in, I'm delivering last year's lesson, right? Because I don't have time to revise that, to update it, to to make it something that's modern for these kids, you know, because if I've been doing this for five years, it could be now six years old, the PowerPoint that I'm pulling up. Right. Um, whereas if you're effective, you're saying, well, do you know what? This is what's coming up. This is my unit that's coming up. What are the current issues that relate to that? You know, where can I pull out some better examples for this year? Uh, maybe I have the time now to create some kind of inquiry-based process for this learning. Uh, so I'll make a video maybe even of the PowerPoint so they can get that in a different format when, when they need it type thing. Uh, and I have freeing myself up to not be at the front presenting, but to actually be with the kids answering their questions when they're struggling. Yeah, and like, and I, I love that exp- explanation. I was thinking about um, something I talk about quite a bit is the notion of like, seeing things as investments as expenditure and expenditures, right? So the one of the examples I give all the time is just greeting kids in the hallway before they enter your classroom, right? So that 10 minutes of time that you spend that you might not be doing something in your classroom, you might be outside just talking to kids, having conversations. Some people will say to me, look, I don't have that 10 minutes. Like I'm so packed in my day. But then what is not seen at that moment is, hey, will that diffuse some classroom management issues, right? Will that have a kid who has more trust with you? And so that 10 minutes that you spent probably saves you hours later. And I think that's something I have to see. And we have to kind of ask like, hey, is this something that uh, if I spend my time on, it's, I'm not getting anything back from it, it's not gonna be helpful to me? Or is this something that when I spend my time on it, it actually will kind of t- kind of replicate over and over again? I think, you know, that's one of the reasons and I say this, like, you know, you build relationships uh, and make people feel valued, they're going to do better and you, and everything will get done quicker. And we, we talked about that. And I think uh, when we talked in our podcast um, and you mentioned your principal, that's something that was evident is that the time she had spent, you know, really kind of connecting with people, got them to do more for her, right? Got, the, uh, you know, more, more for her in the school, obviously. But I really think that when you have an innovative teacher who understands about relationships and how important that is, that children will rise and they will find something that they are passionate about and they will find that they are good at something. And that's what we need to promote, you know, the the individual individuality of each Mm -hmm. child and um, their strengths. And, um, you know, it's, Sometimes I think there's just not enough time in the day to do that. Right. Uh, and, may, and maybe even sometimes there's like, there's such an emphasis on the wrong thing that we have to, do you know what I mean? Like if you look at, for example, the, one of the arguments is parents, parents want their kids to, you know, they're all about the GPA going to college, things like that. Mm-hmm. I actually don't necessarily believe that. I actually, I think parents want what's best for their kids. And sometimes they're, they're not like for lack of a better term off the top of my head, they're brainwashed to think that everything is about grades. And I know that my parents just want what's best for me. And if I actually, to be honest with you, I've written several books. I've, you know, I've done well in my career. If you based my, my, my life on what my GPA was in school, I would have done terribly, right? Like I wasn't a very strong academic student. I was a very smart kid. 
but I was mm-hmm. like smart with relationships. Uh, you know, teachers actually, I had, I had developed, you know, teachers knew that, um, if I, like I was, I had a pretty quick wit. So even at a young age, like I could, you know, really, you know, make a teacher's day very hard. Mm -hmm. And some of them understood. They're like, you know, maybe like we got to teach this guy how to use this for good instead of evil. (laughs) You know what I mean? So like, like he, he actually is very quick on his feet, but this he's not necessarily using it in the best way. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think part of it, as you said, uh, and I actually just wrote a blog post on this is that we don't want, we don't need kids to be good at the same thing. We need every mm-hmm. kid to be good at something. Right. Yes. And, and yes. finding that and part of that too. Mm-hmm. And I think like, if you look at, and this is what I was talking about the parents, um, a lot of the best teachers I've ever worked with were terrible students. But if I, if I hire them based solely on their GPA, a lot of teachers I know who had very strong GPAs were not mm-hmm. necessarily great teachers. And so like it, it, there is a, there is a disconnect there. And I think we have to kind of mm-hmm. understand that there are doors opening for them. Um, yes. The other thing that you said about test prep that I, I think is really interesting is a lot of schools say that, you know, our, our school our you know, our school is over test. And I'm like, do they over test because of government or because your school district makes you take practice tests so they can do really good on the test. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes we, we actually, compound that issue not necessarily and i'm not saying that's true in all places but Mm -hmm. i really appreciate that because i know you and i have a lot of similar thinking on really Mm -hmm. helping kids and understanding them as individuals and that's something that's something really important and so like for anyone that's listening um you know go through your career what are like maybe like some strategies that you either saw as an administrator uh you did as a teacher that really helped you know a, a student that was struggling to actually not necessarily do better in that subject that you were teaching, mm-hmm. but just to do better, you know, do better mm-hmm. in, in whatever field. What are some things that you've, you've seen up throughout your career that really were beneficial in that? Mm-hmm. Well, I mentioned relationships and I think that's probably the most important thing. Um, you know, truthfully, George, you talk about yourself as a student and I would probably mm-hmm. have loved you as a student because I actually <laughs> liked the right. rascal boys. The I mean, I did. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I saw them as being creative. And I, I think that sometimes we do our um, our boys a disservice in school, you know, expecting them to mm-hmm. sit still. And and I shouldn't say just boys because I'm sure it's the same with girls. But I think girls somehow they they are a little more compliant, I guess, in certain ways. But I, I really think that... Um, when as a as a teacher giving kids choices for one thing you know not expecting them all to um to do the same thing at the same time in the same way but having choice boards or having you know rotations so that they could do different things and they could work on projects with their um with others who are interested in the same kinds of things anyway this is i'm actually really fascinated what you're going to say with this question because this is like I don't know what happened that first year, but I always ask people mm. go back to your first year, teach yourself. What advice would you give? And like, I don't know what happened that first year, but if you could go back and talk to yourself, then what, what would you say? I would say fall in love with this profession. Find every chance you can to fall in love with this profession, because this is, I call it the world's second oldest profession or the other oldest profession <laughs> is <laughs> it we, we like, are, oh wait a minute yep there you go there well, you go there it is <laughs> yeah All and right. some and sometimes it feels like that profession but the point is um <laughs> fall in love with this profession because honestly to do this work is the coolest work yeah. there is and everybody who knows it, i know you know it man i've seen you talk i've read your stuff like you are so mm-hmm. deep in this so i don't need to tell you this but to anybody out there who's listening you know if you're not in love with this profession then either you need to dip, get out, or right. you need to remind yourself why we're in the best profession in the world. This is the profession of magic. We work in like the tectonic plates of the humanity. And right. uh, and that's what I would say. Because I had some tough times my first year, man. I, I, when I got let go that first year, I got to do the whole year. I was so depressed. And I felt mm-hmm. like such a jerk. I felt like such a loser. I felt like I didn't measure up. And, and I had all these students and parents who said really nice things. I'm not kidding you, man. This is real. And I still have it. 
the teachers in the school, all of them but four, so it was like 60-some-odd teachers, signed a petition saying I should stay at the school. Oh, the, wow. I, I dig this bad boy out when I'm having a bad time. I've done it like three times since then, and I'm not kidding you. It's like a, it's like a salve on my soul. But this is what I would say to myself. Mike, fall in love with teaching right. and look for people who are in love with the gig, not in love with the, you know, all of the adulation, not in love right. with being able to be told, oh, you're a great teacher. Cause we know those guys, right? We know people who like get off on being heroic. Yeah. I'm saying find the ones who actually love this gig and then like talk to them, listen to them, get into their classroom, see what they're doing. And sometimes they look like, you know, really tough. They look like, you know, hard edges. Yeah. Sometimes they look like really friendly, funny people, whatever. Get around, be omnivorous, hang out with the people who like to ball because this is a game for ballers. That's what teaching is. Before I, I want to ask about the Vanguard teacher program, the teacher leadership program. Uh, tell what, like when you say, Eric, when you say innovative learning, what is innovative learning? What does that mean to you? Well, I think that it's really looking for those connections. You know, sometimes I think uh, the word innovation, I think it's a misconception that you're just always gonna be on the cusp and always right. doing something new. Um, but it is, uh, it is in these new things that we are able to reflect and make adjustments and look for connections and, and use our relationships and our, our information and the ability to work across the district, across every, content area, every grade level, and looking for those connections to be able to do things, you know, in a better way. Yeah. And you said like the actually in, in innovators mindset, um, which is, you know, my book, <laughs> right? So, well, was like, oh, I was going to do shout out, but I was just like, had uh, that button for some reason ready to go. I don't know why. So, uh, so like, I actually, you said both things, right? It's about being new and better. Like it ha and the better is crucial, right? Because I think a lot of times mm -hmm. people that say they're on the cutting edge, and this is an issue with school districts all over the world. They're always trying to do the new thing. They're not good at the last thing. And they just, you know, it's just this cycle. And then we're like, why are teachers so burnt out? And I'm like, because you're teaching them 80 million tools every year. Um, and they, they just, they want to be good at these things, but they don't, they're just, some people just start waiting it out. They're like, look, they're going to teach this, but in two months, they're going to teach this thing. Let's just, I'm going to ignore all of it. Right. And just do what I feel as opposed to like, Hey, how do we actually dig deep? How do we, you know, create better opportunities for our kids? And I think like even this podcast, um, I would actually say, um, is hopefully, and I'm not saying podcasting is innovation, but because I, you know, for me, it was innovative to start it, but like it evolved from, uh, in my, basement with a mic on my phone to like having better equipment, being more thoughtful, like what are some of the different things I can do with this? Like, what are some of the, you know, and you know, they get started with just me and then now it's starting with guests. Right. And it's like, but if I don't have that time to like evolve it and, and create something that I think is way better than what it started as, uh, yeah, of course it's just going to be, but a lot of people just kind of like, Hey, I want to start a podcast, do it for two times. And then they move on to the next thing. And then they never gain any traction with their stuff. So I think it's, you know, true in so many aspects uh, of life. Uh, I'm really interested to hear about this Vanguard teacher leadership program and uh, just kind of like what, what's the, what's the uh, program itself? What's the intent and what do you kind of see uh, the effect of it long-term? So Eric or Amy, whoever like to start, I'd love, I, I know, I know a lot of people know you for this. Uh, for this program uh, at Frederick County Public Schools in Maryland, right? Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, what is, so tell us what tell us about this program. Right. And so years ago, I think about 2015, 2016 school year, we we were starting to go towards one to one, and and we were a district trying to figure out how to scale professional learning and and looking at blended learning, and um, and we certainly we're not the first to kind of think about this, but um, looking at the work of, of Everett Rogers and, and diffusion of innovation mm -hmm. and how do we, how do we get to, you know, the, the, the idea of innovators and early adopters and then early majority, late majority and, and laggards. And, and really that the best way to look at early majority and late majority to get them on board was to support the innovators and early adopters. Uh, really well and have them help us 
to develop a system that the early majority could latch on to um, and, and to bring others along with them. And so it was this idea of investing in teacher leadership that, uh, and really investing in those innovators and early adopters when it came to technology and instruction and um, blended learning and personalized learning models. And so that's where we really spent our time. And we learned a lot from uh, Dr. Stephanie Stevens, um, who worked in Fulton County, Georgia at the time and is now with Microsoft. And, um, and she did a lot for us to say, you know, here's what we're doing and started that sharing that helped us to get our program together. And so today it's evolved into, uh, it's a three-year program. It's a cohort-based model uh, where they focus on the first year on uh, teaching and just being able to mm -hmm. try blended models, try things out, um, see what works and what doesn't in which circumstances. And then they move into the second year of the program, which is uh, the leadership year. And so in that lead year, now they get to share what they've tried. You know, Not that they've become an expert in blended learning and instructional technology, but they get to share what all they're doing. And then in the third year um, is the coach role. And so they've been doing it for two years. They've figured some things out. They're sharing with others and they're coaching and mentoring those um, that are in the other cohorts of the program, as well as others in their schools and across their content areas. And, and really the end result has been, and, and our intent is that uh, they become these embedded coaches throughout our school system. They're, we have Vanguard teachers in uh, currently in 55 schools um, in every content area, you know, every grade level. And what that allows us to do is to, to really leverage them for innovation. Mm -hmm. And so when things like a pandemic occurs and we need support and we need mentoring for other teachers who don't know what they're going to do to teach virtually or to uh, teach in some sort of concurrent model where they have students at home and in front of them at the same time, we were, you know, sort of accidentally prepared almost right. for that type of a situation because we had teachers in almost every school in our district that not only were, um, had some experience with blended models, but they had the confidence, they were comfortable with coaching others. Right. And so, um, yes, it's really about blended and personalized learning and that becomes the content, but the, the intent and the natural progression of them as, you know, leaders and coaches in our district has really been a, just an, an amazing outcome for us as a district. And, and we look forward to continuing to, to build on that and to continue to add We're we're going through the selection process for our sixth cohort right now, um, going through this program and, um, excited to have this, this team. And Amy, can I ask you like, how, how are, like, how are the people who are in this program, like identified, how do they become a part of this in your school district? Well, they, they have an application process. So they, they choose to apply for the program. They give us evidence of, of their different, um, capabilities within different track. So whether it's, uh, you know, leadership, um, how they're leveraging technology right now, we've always said that we, we really want people to be pointed in the right direction. They don't need to be down the path, mm -hmm. but they need to be pointed in the right direction. And then the program itself will lift them up with the professional learning network and help them move along that path. And they'll move along with people, right? Right. Um, so when they go through that process, they also have recommendations from their administrators. Um, we love the fact that our vanguards help us reach out to other potential vanguards. So every year, uh, we always make sure that our current vanguards send personal notes out to people that they think are ready to join the program. Right. So we really try, and just like Eric said, we leverage our own professional learning network within the program to reach out to people who are ready for the opportunity. Love that. We actually, so in my school district, uh, I led this program. It was like, it has elements that there are some similarities uh, in it. And we called it um, for the innovative teaching and learning leads. 
And um, we, we saw something that was being delivered in another school district in Canada. And what they had done was basically they wanted, they were trying to implement laptops, right? And you can tell you, this is obviously a long time ago, because that's what they were, you know, and so they would give teachers a laptop, but at the end, they had to take these 12 sessions. And then once they took the 12 sessions, once they did all, all that stuff, then they got a laptop, um, you know, at the end of it. And so they would have like 50 teachers a year. And basically what they would do was they would have 50 teachers have these technical skills and then they go out and, you know, so you had 50 more teachers with technical skills than when you started. So my superintendent asked me, he said, Hey, I want to, I want you to look at that program and see if we can implement it. I said, I don't, I don't, there's something I don't like about it. Um, let me tweak it and see what I can do. So, uh, what we, we were looking at, you know, uh, students having, you know, iPads and, you know, or like tablets at the time. And what we actually had said, I like what I said, I was like, Hey, how about instead of 12, we do six and it, because we do six and let's give the devices to the teachers in the program at the beginning, let them play with it, have it over summer, let their kids play with it. Just, just play around. Right. Um, but because they're doing six, they have to teach, uh, two sessions, you know, to their own staff. Right. And so, so, cause we wanted these, this learning to spread, right. Which is, I think is kind of the key to what you're doing, but when we identified, and this is why I asked you that question, when we identified who it was, uh, we actually said to our administrators to identify people they thought for the program. But the key was don't identify someone who's good with technology. Okay. Cause like, that's not what we're looking for now. If they're good with technology, that's great. But what we're looking for is people who have influence on your staff that when, so like if they're actually bad with technology, but they have influence and I can get them here and they go, Oh, this is amazing. And they're like, Susie thinks this is amazing. Then you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to try it. Right. Because like I was always good with technology, you know, in, in connection to school. And a lot of times that actually led to issues like, Oh, that's, that's a George thing. Right. And I, I the, and so we actually just brought people together, talked about teaching. And now some of the principals, I'll be honest with you, they didn't listen to anything I said. And they just sent people that wanted to learn. Like I want an app for kindergarten. I'm like, nope, that's not what we're doing here. Right. But I'll teach you how to like, go find that on your own. 